And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us all the way from Tab Creations, the, mas the mastermind and or evil genius, depending on interpretation, of the Saga Machine system, which has, po which has powered games such as Shadows Over Soul, Against the Dark Yogi, and Age of Ambition, now coming back with a campaign setting for Shadows Over Soul with Jovian Whispers, the one and only... Thor Thorin, not Odinson, Tabor. How are you doing today, man? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. Sorry about the Thor joke. I had to get that out of my way since I didn't get it <laughs> last time. You've probably heard a bunch of them anyways. That's true. Um, so, Jovi so as, I as I understand it, Jovian Whispers is a, ca is a campaign and source book for Shadows Over Soul. Now, That's right. Was this something that you had? Was this something that you had in the works when it came to Shadows Over Soul, as as from the get from the get go, or what? Or was it? Or were its origins a little bit more recent? Yeah. So the seeds of the campaign were laid right in the core book. Um, uh, it talks about the mystery of the Jupiter Group incident, which is kind of the core mystery of the campaign. Uh, that's mentioned, but never really fully explained in the core book. And uh, so it's, it's got to start there, but it's really kind of like grown a lot since then, uh, just from my own personal campaigns and other like creative ideation. Um, uh, and it's kind of grown into this whole uh, campaign that we're uh, we're kickstarting, uh, and it also covers. Uh, it also serves as, serves as a source book on the Jovian colonies. Uh, they're kind of like uh, creepy abandoned colonies that are. Uh, Right for some sci-fi horror exploration. Yep. Um, now, when it comes to now, um, shifting ba shifting back a little bit, since for a lot of my, for a lot of the pe for a lot of the people in the temple, this will be their relative first introduction to Shadows Over Soul. Um, the last time I had you on, we did talk about some of the humble origins of the Saga Machine and the glory that is the old um, TSR Saga system. But what was the what were the big inspirations when it came to the creation of Shadows Over Soul? So Shadows Over Soul as a setting um, uh, is a it's a sort of like dark sci-fi sci-fi horror setting. It's two hundred years in the future. Um, it, think of it kind of like oh, The Expanse meets. Alien, or like John Carpenter's The Thing, hmm. uh, with a well, you know, with a, a good dash of sort of like uh, cyberpunk style gang warfare and Mars thrown in for good measure. Yep. Um. With with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, for a lot for a lot of for a lot of people, especially especially of a young, especially of a younger sort. Um, one of the key th one of the key things that'll come to mind th for them when it comes to sci-fi horror is the um, Dead Space games, especially the first two. Would that would that yeah. be would that be applicable when it comes to the th when it comes to the style of um, Shadows Over Soul? Oh yeah, it's ap absolutely applicable to Shadows Over Soul, and it's it's very applicable to this campaign in in, in specific. Yeah. So, well, g so um. We'll we'll um get it we'll get into that. Now, when it comes to the Ju when it comes to the Jupiter Group incident, um, I'd like you to I'd like you to kind of give a bit of the background and then lead into the lead into where that factors in when it comes to jo when it comes to Jovian whispers. All right. So, in uh in the campaign setting. Um, uh, on April first, twenty two oh nine. That's five years before the the present day in in the setting. Mm -hmm. um, so, without warning, all four Jovian colonies went silent. And then, two days later, on April third, a single message was broadcast, and that was: the Jovian colonies and associated satellites are now the property of Jupiter Group. Do not approach Jupiter. Do not transmit to Jupiter. Failure to comply will be met in full. Will be met with force. And so, in these five years that's happened since, uh, all. Uh, attempts to reestablish contact with Jupiter have failed, and all and all expeditions there have been met with disaster. So it's this sort of like 
looming mystery of what happened to the Jovian colonies. You know, they just suddenly went quiet. There's the one message it broadcast for like 10 days and then just nothing for five years. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's the, the the sort of like backdrop that leads into the campaign. Um, uh, and uh, what will happen very, very early in the campaign. So, so minor spoilers for like the very early events of the campaign, just warning to anyone listening. Um, uh, but what happens very early in the campaign is your player characters, your, your crew... Uh, end up running the blockade. Uh, the, the, the colonies have been interdicted by Unitech, which is one of the big megacorps in the in the setting, and uh, running that blockade, the interdiction, and uh, realizing that they're, they they can't, it, it's it's failed. Like, the ships blockading it have, uh, are, have similar, something's happened to them, just like the colonies, and that kind of opens up this sort of, like, gold rush to, uh, of, like, scrappers and other people ready to, like, move into the Jovian colonies and, like, I don't know, loot it for any sort of valuables or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's it's kind of sets up the backdrop of the campaign. So it's a lot of, like, mix of the sort of, like, creepy exploration of these abandoned colonies and the sort of, like, horror that, you know, cut them off in the first place mixed with the sort of, like, gold rush feel and the rivals of other scrappers and stuff like that. All right. Um, can... can sin- Going on, going off the inspirations. One other thing, one other thing that I'm reminded of, especially when you mention scrappers, is a film that a film that, admittedly, I have a soft spot for, but completely, fa- but completely failed when it came when it came out. Are you familiar with the film Virus? I'm not actually. That was a interesting little um cre- little creature feature of of a film that came out in the in the. I want to say early two thousands. Um, mm-hmm. It was based on it was based on a comic book of the same name, though there's a significant amount of difference. And a big re- a big reason why I feel apropos bringing bringing that up is in Virus you had the monster was essentially electricity that could think. Um, and within um. Ju- and within the colonies of Jupiter, you have something known as the insurrection virus. Is now I've um I've dabbled in Eclipse Phase, of course, and I've had I've had the creator of Eclipse Phase on on the show. So when I see something like insurrection virus, I immediately think of some sort of memetic virus. Is it similar to Is it similar to that? It is, in fact, uh, sort of similar to that, and uh, I forget what the name of the. The virus is an eclipse phase, but it it, it it does have a similar sort of theme going on there. Um, uh, it's less sort of like technological singularity uh, than the, the virus in eclipse phase, but there's there's a lot of overlap there thematically. Yeah. Um, the Titans is what is what you're thinking of. That's right. Yeah. Um, the exosurgent virus and the created the Titans. That was right. Yep. It's, it's been a while since I played eclipse phase. Mm-hmm. Now, given now given given the fact that you. Now, with some with something like Jovian Whispers, given the fact that I'd say I'd say based on how you've described it, a lot of it is going to be on on exploration. So within so within within that, are are you setting up the are you setting up the maps and the layouts of the of the um of the colonies within it so that so that people can kind of venture off on venture off on their relative own. Within the within the campaign, uh, yeah, there's going there's going to be um, sort of layout of the four sort of like major Jovian colonies plus a couple mining claims there, mm-hmm. and uh, the campaign is set up where uh, the first two scenarios really sort of like set up the whole campaign and start the action, and then there's the 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 last couple um, uh, c- kind of bring it all to the climax. There, in between, it's it's basically set up where there's a lot of uh, player agency where they can kind of go off on their own and explore different things, and, uh, but just you know work for different patrons and just see where the winds take them. Mm-hmm. Now, I mentioned I mentioned um, I mentioned Dead Space earlier, and within within the fair amount of of horror um, video games and. I know I am well aware that I'm committing blasphemy by bringing up video games and discussion of tabletop games. Some of the um, grognards really hate it when I do that, which is why <laughs> I keep doing it. But 
there's a mo there's a motif that often that often appears use in within a within a lot of horror games in general and a lot, and um a lot of science fiction horror games especially and that is Reve that is revealing what happened before through journals and audio logs and the like. Is something like that going to be present in in some form of handouts within um within this campaign? Uh, certainly. Um, there that we uh you know we lean into that trope ourselves in uh in some of the exploration going on here, and you can kind of I think th I think in general horror is a lot. I don't know, spookier, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, sort of like unnerving when you don't fully understand what happened, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think going through the like, little handouts and piecing bits together information and trying to, like, fit together the puzzle of, like, what happened in these different colonies, it serves serves the genre really well, you know, because you, you start off just knowing little bits, and you, you eventually get a much better picture and can kind of put the story together, but you're never really 100% certain and that just kind of you know keeps you a little bit a little bit uh you know off your balance really and i think that works well in a horror game yeah now since you since we're delving into how uh, into how to do horror into do how to do horror um now this is a question that i'm that i'm sure you've gotten a fair i'm sure you've gotten a fair sh share of times and it's something that i would inevitably have to deal with at my table how do you maintain how do you maintain horror when you have a t when you have a table that is at some degree genre savvy because well we're all we're all a bunch of nerds so that kind of thing is inevitable yeah so like uh, at a certain point you know you just kind of have to you know get get player buy in and uh lean into that and yeah one of the things i do uh that when i when i feel i need to uh not all the time but uh is I go through and like just before the campaign, just talk with the players and like, hey, you know, like, are we making characters that are genre savvy or not? Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of see what they feel because I think that sort of thing works works better when it's everyone or no one sort of thing. Like, if everyone agrees, okay, we're going to make two characters who aren't genre savvy here, and they 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 play up. Oh, let's split up. That would be great. You know, like. Uh, yeah, you can play with that because you know you know that's coming, you know, and uh, they, they can play into that trope. On the other hand, if everyone is genre savvy, you know, you can also like it's it's going to create a different feel of campaign. But you could certainly like lean into that and uh, end up with a Evil Dead sort of feel to your sci-fi horror. Yeah, yeah. And actually, actually, now that I think about it, I'm trying I'm trying to think if there's been if there's been a case of a of a science fiction equivalent of of Evil Dead. The closest I can think of is Dark Star, and that doesn't really count. Yeah. Um mainly because Dark Star was a was supposed to be a parody of 2001. <laughs> and so, and somehow that ended up leading to ended up being a stepping stone for the creation of the original Alien because um because Ro because Roger Corman is a cheapskate. <laughs> I saw Dark Star a long long time ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah, that was Ridley Scott was invo was involved in that, and um, the reason I have to bring up Roger Corman is, while he certainly helped give a lot of people hit their big breaks when it came to filmmaking, he had a reputation for exemplifying the worst parts of B movie cinema, namely and being an embarrassingly embarrassingly um, cheap guy. Yeah. Um. Now. Wh now, um, when it comes to when it comes to the campaign, it's listed on the Kickstarter pages that that it's going to consist of five core scenarios, along with some side tre along with some side trek adventures. Um, when it comes to those core scenarios, are they are they ones that are they ones that are more like chapters, or 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 are they um, tent poles that can be done in any order? Um, there. So the, really, the way it's set up is uh, there's the two, the, the first two really kind of set up set up the campaign, and they really need to be done in in, in the first fir order. They're really meant. You start off kind of run these two right in a row, and that sets up really everything else. Mm -hmm. And the last two are really the climax that kind of brings everything to a close. And then the the middle one of the five is kind of the uh, oh, think of it as like the the mid season reveal that can 
go kind of anywhere in the middle there. Yeah. Um, so those five really kind of have to be done in order because they hit certain dramatic beats that kind of like set up the, the beginning, middle, end. Mm. Uh, but the sidetrack scenarios, I think there's going to be, I, I think 17 was what I counted uh, currently in the book. Um, uh, but those can be done basically in any order there um, uh, in, in the middle. And so that's that, that was a lot of the player agency there I, mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier. Um, but the, the the five core ones do more or less have to be done in that order. All right. In that in that regard, it kind it kind of reminds me of the tiers and tent poles um, structure. Uh, yeah, it's 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 sort of like that. Um, I'm also a big fan of uh, like like Pinnacle Entertainment does a lot of their their plot point campaigns, uh, and it's 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 kind of set up set up along those lines. Part of the inspiration there. I... Mm-hmm. And. When it come now, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to encounters, and obviously, um, encounter encounters have to ha- have to have a have to have a bit of scary factor. But um, have but in te- in testing, have you had any? Have you had all that many incidents of TPKs? I haven't actually had that many instances of TPKs. Now, I've had lots of instances of a player or two dying when it comes to a when it comes to an encounter. But I, I there's only been one full on TPK in my playtesting that I remember. Um, uh, and uh, it was it was a memorable and it was it was dramatic. But uh, yeah, that's that's been my experience. Maybe that's you know maybe that's just the way I set things up, and maybe my you know some of the players have a tendency to uh, well, some have let's say a much more uh, survival instinct than others. Um, uh, that's probably a good way of putting it. Yeah, and well, it, it's certainly it's certainly fitting within the genre because there's because there's always because in a horror film when you have the ten little Indians, there's always that one guy who's um, gonna do something he's gonna regret. That's true. <laughs> he's just not gonna regret it for long because, well, he's dead. Yeah. Um. And when it comes, furthermore, when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to monsters, um, you're probably familiar with the with one of the unwritten rules when it comes to horror in film of don't show the monster. Yep. Or don't. And obviously, obviously, that's not meant to be taken completely literally, but it's more of don't ex- don't expose too much of it. Um, how do you maintain that within within something like a role playing game setting? Well, I uh, for me at least, you know, like well, some of the like, the techniques I like to do when I'm gymming is, uh, you know, you you want you want to first introduce the idea that something is not right early on, you know, even if it's not obvious what it is. And then there should be definitely some evidence that, you know, like, the monster has been here. You know, like, even if it's not coming face-to-face with the monster, it's, you know, seeing, you know, the, the grisly remains that the monster has done or the the weird, you know, uh, deep scratches in the airlock that show just how strong this thing is based on, you know, how far it got down and scraping the metal or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's also good to like throw in some supporting NPCs if you can, because if you, if you, if you can have it, other NPCs, you know, like a company or characters running around, you can do the the sort of like they split up and then get picked off thing, um, uh, pretty easily, um, uh, and that's uh, or, or otherwise just have the encounter, you know, they saw it and can specify some details among them stuttering or something like that, but like it didn't get a very good view or something, and then yeah, that leads up to the you know the the players encountering it and um. Uh, Hopefully, in a situation that where they're you know not prepared to just you know like run in guns flying, um, because uh, then you know that, let, that lets them you know regroup and then you know plan their their attack or escape or or whatever it ends up being. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it com- when it comes to the col- when it comes to the whole exploring the colonies themselves, um. Is a lot of is a lot of the adventure just just exploring one particular area, or is the or is there the option to explore multiple um, colonial spots, for lack of a better term? Yeah. So uh, in, in the setting, there are, there are four major Jovian colonies, and all four are visited over the course 
uh, I guess three of them in, in the core scenarios and one of them in just in the, the side tricks. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, all of them are up for exploration. There's also a number of mining claims that weren't you know, major colonies or other inhabited areas that end up uh, getting explored. Um, and then there's you know, some, some other ships as well that aren't necessarily like, you know, colonies, but were otherwise, you know, something has gone wrong since other groups have moved into these Jovian colonies and you've got to figure out, oh, you know, like, uh, what, what stupid thing that these guys do? What, you know, what did they wake up or whatever? Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the topic of NPCs. Now, normally, the, normally, this, normally NPCs in a module is something that I'd see as a given, but when it comes to doing horror, um, there's a different set of rules, I think. So, with with Jovian Whispers, um, what's your what's your stance when it comes to including and when, when including um, NPCs in the in the colonies? Is that something that you'd prefer avoiding to try and make it as isolationist as possible? Mm -hmm. Would you have it as say um, a as NPCs that aren't that aren't um, directly interactable f physically? i.e. I. some sort of AI approach, or something in the middle? I mean, probably, you know, like a combo of those things. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I prefer to start a little more isolated, because really, like, isolation is done really well. Like, I think, like, Alien or uh, The Thing are both great examples of, you know, sort of, like, very isolated environments, and that really ups the horror feel, because, you know, they just they can't just up and run away. That's why they're, they're trapped there. And, um, uh, you know, that, that, that's, I think that's a good way to start things. But as, uh, you know, more and more groups move into Jupiter trying to, like, you know, this sort of, like, scrap gold rush here, um, uh, I think you can have, you know, other ones that have shown up in other places and uh, you can find meet them or what, what remains of them in some cases. Um, uh, you know, and you can kind of just go run the gamut there. Um, uh, some, some of those colonies, you know, may be more uh, eventually populated than others. Yeah. Now, when when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the four colonies, um, now obviously, I, obviously, um, going into any spoiler territory is uh, is something I don't want to do here. But I'd like you to tell me what you can what you can about each about each of them and what they were possibly like before everything went to hell. All right. Uh, so uh, Jackal uh, was an orbital colony, um, uh, and it. It, uh, so, uh, one of the things about Jupiter, and it's like a real life fact, is it's got a very, very intense, uh, radiation belt. Uh, that is, uh, the particles coming off of Io get wrapped up around, you know, in Jupiter's orbit and, uh, like, kind of like supercharged there. And it interferes with, uh, radio communication and, uh, apologize. Uh, that's my phone going off spam. Um, uh, uh, you know, and it, it, it interferes with, you know, comms and other stuff like that, which is just great fodder for, you know, sort of like sci-fi horror there. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, so Jack Roll was basically a, a big space relay. So it was meant to get, capture these signals from the other, you know, the colonies on the, the moons of Jupiter and send that out to the other, the rest of the, the rest of the solar system so that they could, you know, call in and out and gets over that radiation belt. So it's, it. Unlike the the moons is very isolated up in space, and um, uh, it had a uh, a terrible explosion that sort of like damaged the colony and uh, lost all of its atmosphere. So it's it's uh, very sort of like dead in a sense there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then there's uh, on uh, Ganymede, um, uh, there is a colony that was a big mining colony. Um, it was used to mine a lot of thorium, which is uh, a radioactive element that's used in, as a lot as fuel in the setting. And um, uh, it uh, has a has a sort of very sort of like rough industrial sort of thing uh, going on there. Um, uh, and uh, it, its mines were worked even after um, uh, even after the Jupiter Grip incident by uh, you know spoilers to say what, but uh, it's uh, it's been developed significantly there. Um, uh, and then on Europa, uh, there was uh, Vida Unda, which was a big scientific colony under the ice. And it was once like the cultural sort of capital of uh, the Jovian colonies. And it's down there where the, the ice meets the like uh, 
the ocean, you know, the, the big uh, water there um, uh, under, under the ice in Europa. And it's, it's, it's definitely got a very sort of like the thing feel to it. And um, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, whatever monstrosities has, you know, has caused the Jupiter group, Jupiter group, has caused the Jupiter group incident has built a sort of like temple like thing there. And uh, and then there was uh, another colony on Europa that was uh, on top of the ice and was uh, already kind of downhill even before the Jup- going downhill even before the Jupiter Group incident because most of the most of the money and population moved on to Vita Unda and it was it was an earlier colony but uh, it's uh, it's uh, oh uh, it feels it feels much more like a war zone because um. Uh, 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 whatever thing or things caused the Jupiter Group incident may not uh, always see eye to eye. Mm-hmm. And the other, with some of the with some of these co- with some of these colonies, how if you were to ballpark it, how bi- how um, big would you say some of them are population wise compared to um, compared to a, compared to certain cities or um, st- or states? Yeah, so um, they're they're all you know comparatively small compared to um, uh, major you know Earth cities uh, because well uh, keeping people alive in space is uh, t- tends to be very expensive. Um, uh, but uh, they're uh, mostly probably in the tens of thousands of people, mm-hmm. although um, uh, the one of the the European, uh, although the orbital colony was a bit smaller than that, probably just in the thousands, um, just because he, uh, you know, of fewer natural resources there in orbit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, on your on Europa, you're gonna have pl- you're gonna have pl- you're gonna have plenty of ice and th- and ever and everybody needs water in some form. That's right. Uh, you need ice and water in some form, and in the setting, they uh, discovered um, uh, microscopic life on in, living in, under the ocean in Europa sometime before you know before all of this, and that was a uh, part of their um, uh, research and uh, you know bioengineering there. Mm-hmm. Well, you did you did say that there was a more scientific end to the um, to the European colonies, so that so that would certainly make sense. Um, also, it was giving also was giving me Bioshock flashbacks for some reason. Don't know why. Um, now, within now with when you mentioned that when you mentioned that one of them was a war zone, was this, given that would it be more likely that that particular um, colony would be more likely to have more conventional encounters, i.e., inca- i.e., encounters with nor- with regular people shooting at you instead of ungodly abominations trying to shoot at you uh yeah there's there's a fair amount of that in that particular colony all right i can i can certainly i can certainly see that and the other one of the big questions that that is inevitable especially when you're dealing with any sort of science fiction storytelling is um ai use cuz in a lot of there's a well-worn cliche that there's some sort of AI that does the day-to-day operations when it comes to managing the colony, and the big decisions are left up to whoever's in, whoever's in charge of the place. Is that is that kind of thing present here when it comes to the colonies? Uh, so that that's less the case in Shadows Over Soul as a whole, mm-hmm. but it is uh, it, it is somewhat the case in uh, this particular campaign. Um, uh, Uh, just, just uh, part, part of the uh, you know, thematic elements there. All right. All right. Now, when it com- when it comes to when it comes to the- when it comes to exploring a- exploring a given area, a lot of um, a lot of people will write a areas ex- an areas exploration part as um, they'll show they'll show an overall map and then de- and then detail various important se- important sectors sections or points of interest is a similar approach being used with Jovian whispers or do you have a different format in mind when it comes to the exploration part 
there's a, a similar uh, that's a, there's a similar approach to that in at least two of the colonies, um, uh, and there's you know the sort of map that players might pull up, and then there's also the, then there's the GM's version um, uh, because the 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 map the players might you know pull up from you know old computer records or something is at this point five years out of date, mm-hmm. and uh, you know uh, construction and other things have happened since then, so it's not going to be entirely accurate and intentionally so uh, in ways that I think drive uh, drive the sort of uh, uh, terrifying encounters there. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to some when it comes to some of the um, fo- when it comes to some of the foes and challenges, um, we are we already I think well covered the kind the kind of foes that that one might that one might see, but when it comes to chal- when it comes to challenges that aren't necessarily um, your your um, monster of this of this week or monster of the season I should say. What could, what would be a few examples of what people could come to expect in that regard? Uh, so, uh, just make sure I understand. So, just throwing out, you know, other sort of like foes that uh, the the players might encounter. Um, uh, well, there's there's certainly sort of like uh, corporate black ops teams that, that might be encountered. Uh, rival scrapper gangs. Um, uh, there's a good deal of, you know, if you, if you, if you're thinking, um, uh, dead space, there's a good deal of, you know, sort of like bio horror type monsters uh, that might be encountered, um, uh, or sort of hijacked, you know, automaton AI sorts are certainly, uh, certainly present. Yep. Uh, and. When and um, give, given the fact that I've me- given the fact that I've mentioned um, mentioned dead mentioned dead space, um, obviously with the, especially with the especially with the first two games, we don't want to talk about the third one. There's uh, there's a lot of emphasis on f- on on finding and and um, and me- and messing with the stuff that you find in order to, in order to help yourself um, survive. And I'm cur- I'm curious if there if there's going to be some not necessarily an equipment table per se, but some equipment that the pl- that they can that players can stumble across to help them help them survive and get and find and find places of relative safety. Relative being the operative word here. Oh yeah, that's uh you know that is a you know a fairly significant reoccurring theme in this, in part because you know you're you're. You know, your crew is going off to this, you know, the player characters are going off to this place that has more or less been closed off from the rest of humanity for the last five years. And so it it doesn't have, like, a functional economy and shops where you can go buy stuff. So a lot of this is going to be, you know, like, uh, salvaging, you know, salvaging what you can to survive and finding, you know, some useful stuff there. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes, there's been times in some, in some entries when it comes when it comes to SF when it comes to SF horror where um peop where um the you either have cases where the where the power is completely dead or or it's only semi active in in places um how how um how, how gone dark is are a lot of the uh, colonies do they still have the, most of their most of their um electricity still working um, uh, so the, the, the orbital colony, Jackrel, is pretty much gone dark. Um, it, it suffered a pretty catastrophic failure in its reaction and uh, blew a hole in the side of the colony and vented all of the atmosphere. Uh, the other three ones on the moons uh, mostly have power, but it may very well be on the fritz in certain areas uh, where power cables have been cannibalized for other purposes. Um, uh, And of and of course you of course in that regard you can you can easily make a a side a side trek of an adve- of an adventure trying to re- trying to restore power, and possibly freaking out anybody around there who thinks that you shouldn't be restoring power. That's right. What have you done? Because mm-hmm. you you know how you know how it is with this with this kind of genre. People think that they're doing the right thing, and all that it, it does is make things absolutely worse. Oh, absolutely, and that—that that, I, 
I'm positive that will happen several times over the course of the campaign if you, if you play the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the sidetrack parts, it's interesting that you mentioned Pinnacle because one of the things I, that first drew my, my attention in the early days of um, Pinnacle were the one-page adventures. When it comes to the sidetracks, are they a, are they of a similar size? Are they is it a smaller case or is it a case where it's a bit larger than the one than the one offs that um, Pinnacle had? So um, they they run kind of a gamut there. Most of the sidetracks are a bit longer than the typical sort of like uh, one sheets that Pinnacle puts out. Um, I, I most of them are well, I'd say in the range of four to eight pages. Um, uh, but there are a couple that, that, that run a little bit short. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that should hopefully give you an idea of the, the, the relative size and text yep. of, uh, of the scenarios. They, 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 most of the side tracks are intended to be like a, a one, sort of like with these one session scenarios. So it gives you enough where you can, you know, set up the sort of like a monster of the week or the escort quest of the week or whatever the, you know, the particular theme ends up being. And um, uh, you know, go off and have a good evening gaming. Yeah. Now I'm get now within the within this particular within this particular um, campaign book. I'm guessing I'm guessing that the major that um the majority of the majority of it, aside aside from aside from maybe a few pages at the start, is st is stuff that is best left for the GM to read more than it is for the players. Yeah, that is that is very much the case. Oh, I'd, ima I'd imagine that that having the players read some parts of it is probably is probably going to lean a little bit too much into the um, spoiler end of things. And last thing anybody wants is somebody doing metagaming. Yeah, there's a the, the introduction is a chapter is player friendly enough, and actually it'll come with a handout where you can give the you, you know you can basically you know print it out and. Or, yeah, export that page or whatever, and then hand that out to the players, and that will give them basically all the background they need to know on the Jupiter Group incident and uh, you know other common knowledge going into the campaign. Yep. Now, when it comes to the side tracks, um, is it list? Is, are there recommends listed as far as when as far as when would be ideal or less ideal um, positions in positions in the story to place them? Uh, there's yeah the the the. Opening paragraph or two usually has a suggestion of uh, this is best run, you know, after this or sometime before the players decide to do this stupid thing. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of flexibility there. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, I'm and I'm guess I'm guessing it, I'm guessing in the after in the aftermath of a lot of those side tracks, there's a few bullet points for how for how um how some of those can be expanded further on by the GM. That's right. Now, in within um within playtesting of the, of this particular of this particular campaign, what would you say were some of the big takeaways you had from your from your experiences? Um, big takeaways are um uh, well um. Uh, some people really, really love biohorror, and it, some people very much do not. Um, uh, and I think that is uh, that is something you know, like you know, mention it to your players and get get a feel for what they like and don't like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I also, you know, like sometimes people are really hard to predict too. Um, uh, you know, you, you think they're going to like okay, you know, presented with this, this horrible stuff going on, you think okay, they're they're probably going to do this or this, and then they just. Interpret it very differently and run the different direction, and it's it's interesting to see you know like what players will assume and not assume when they're really scared for their character's life, and uh, just how reckless some will be or how opposite of that. Well, like, well, are you really doing your G job as a GM if your players are not paranoid of you? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, my players are par my players are paranoid of me, but that's simply because of my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> um. Now, with it now, um, give now taking that taking that into account, were there were there 
were were there cases where there where there were certain um cer certain ch for lack of a better term chapters or certain side tracks that the that some players found harder than others and how and how did you address that if that happened uh there are um uh, so what one of the things i like to do uh when you know play testing one of these they can always adjust it you know before it goes into print but also but then when it comes time to running it, I like to think of different possible exits from this scenario. You know, there, there's, there, 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 oftentimes there's a straightforward, you know, they go to, you know, a certain place because of, you know, a patron hired them or they're supposed to escort somebody there or something or they just think it's going to have some good loot. Um, they, you know, they, they explore, they run into the, the monster of the week or the other problem and then deal with it. But I, li I, like, to, I like to think of it as a, a couple other exit points too where if uh, it's presenting more of a problem... Um, uh, you know, this is a possible place where, you know, they could make it out and survive even if they don't get what they came for, or, uh, or he, this is a possible way to, um, uh, you know, put a twist there that would make it a, a little more challenging. Yeah. Now, given the, given the fact that you, that one of the big things you mentioned was a, was salvaging a, in a, um, gold rush form. When it comes to some of the more purely mechanical encounters, do you have do you have a bit of an aside as far as as far as what might be what might be useful to to salvage if some if somebody decides to um, literally loot the body? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty good about pointing out you know useful things that can be salvaged there in the text. Um, uh, players so hopefully will pick up on that and uh, keep their eye out for such things, but. Sometimes I need GM nudging. Yeah. Now, if I, now, if I, now as I'm as I'm reading as I'm reading this um pro, this um, proper, you're shooting f you're shooting for about I believe 160 pages for this for the campaign. Yep. Um. And when when. I'd, how much? How? What? Pers obviously, obviously, we can't go with a with a page number proper. But when it comes to just describing the the um the Jupiter group itself, how much of that is dedicated to that? Um. So again, got the document right up here. I mean, guess to me, one. Mm -hmm. Uh, looks like it's about ten pages in the draft text, and that. You know, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, depending how it ends up in the layout. But mm -hmm. and take and uh, with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, the as for at the at the um now this I think this was mentioned, but at and I'm not asking for spoilers, but at the end, do you have do you have a section pl planned? For um, how how the events that the events of Jovian Whispers can be taken into uh, into other um, further adventures. Uh, yeah, there's there's a whole like little further adventure section that's uh, you know a few pages and has some some suggestions of different you know directions you can take this and run with it um, uh, depending on how things resolved. All right, and. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the for the project? I know I know you, I know it's I know things are still in flux, so I'll ask w regarding the digital version primarily. So let me think. This campaign ends uh, near the end of May. Mm -hmm. um, I hope to have, uh, you know, I hope to have the initial digital version. Uh, two people uh, sometime. Uh, I hope to have the initial digital version to people late June, early July, and then probably a finalized digital version uh, a month or so after that. This way it gives uh, a little bit of time for people to you know, catch any typos that slipped through and get those fixed before it goes to print. Mm -hmm. And when, and when it comes... And, um... Even though... Even though it lo even though there's a few there's a few stretch goals that are that are currently unlocked and and possibly a few more down down the road, um, I'm guessing you I'm guessing that that won't extend the page count all that much. Uh, yeah, uh, most of the stretch goals in this case are, um, uh, 
going to be delivered as uh, uh, sort of like PDF extra scenarios to all backers. And uh, one of the stretch goals is a compilation of all of those scenarios is in its own little its own little booklet. So that that should be a uh, you know separate inter- that will we'll be putting those together after the main book. But yeah, you know, we're very much on track to get the the main book out there, and we've did we've did a pretty good job of that in the past. So. Mm-hmm. So, with with all that in mind, I will cer- I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how how this develops. And as I mentioned before, we went on air, and in the interest of full disclosure, I did pit- I did pitch in. So I'm one of those currently 136 people who've um, backed. And I do want to give my congratulations for get for getting over twice your initial goal at the time of this recording. Thank you very much, and thank you for support. Yep. Um. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you once again for being willing to come to come all the way back to the temple and brave the hell of time zones <laughs> to re- to reach it. Um, and anytime you see fit to return, whether it's j- whether it's for a future entry in Saga Machine or j- or just to l- just to laugh at the dice gods being cruel to someone, uh, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody!